So welcome everybody to our um, webinar today, which um, will touch or with with the title "Inclusive Energy Planning." Um, thank you for be for being here. I see people coming in, so I will wait a little bit before starting. Um, yeah. Yo, wow. Uh, thanks for coming. Um, the webinar today um, is, um, joy, is, is a kind of consequence of, of other webinars that we have been um, co-producing in cooperation with um, the Access Coalition. And um, my name is Willington Ortiz. I'm a researcher at the Wuppertal Institute for Climate and Environment and Energy. And I will have the, um, the pleasure to facilitate the dialogue today. And um, we will delve into the question, how can national wide energy plans and policies provide appropriate responses to, to the very local context led conditions and opportunities of communities. It's kind of that's why we uh, put on in, in the title this idea of bridging between the very locality of people's livelihoods and the more national-wide governance processes. And for that, um, we have the fortune of having today. Uh, we have invited two experts with long experience in the energy access field, and both are currently leading energy planning processes, one in Kenya and one in, in Malaysia, which are designed in a very bottom-up fashion. So we, we have the opportunity today to learn about how this kind of process can be designed. Um, but before starting, I would like to uh, uh, recall a, a couple of, of takeaways that we have had from the, from the other webinars, because um, as I mentioned, uh, this is the fourth of a series of webinars. Um, you can uh, take a look on all of this webinar uh, on our website, huitions.net, uh, and there you can also find uh, uh, very synthesized uh, takeaways that we have co-produced with our speakers. Um, so where, when, when you find the, the key issues that were um, um, yeah, discuss it on the, on those webinars. So, please the, the next slide. So, and and I uh, I think it's it's very interesting to see that across the whole webinars, this importance of the of understanding the lo the local um, uh, conditions and capacities of 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 the communities have been raised. For example, in our first webinar, we uh, explored what are the synergies between energy access and, and sustainable development in general. And one of the um, recommendations of our speakers was one should start by recognizing the strategies of the households of the people that they already apply to ensure their, their, their livelihoods. And they also um, recommended us to start by co-designing energy interventions, taking into consideration the capacities and the knowledge of people. In the second webinar, um, we uh, explored uh, methods and experiences on understanding those uh, uh, conditions and, and opportunities of people, of communities. And um, there, our speakers recommended us to take a cross-sector approach uh, because they uh, uh, share to us observations from, from their experiences that people tend not to, to think in, in energy terms uh, when, when thinking about development or a better life. So it's, it's better to ask how energy can have improvements in other development sectors that are probably more closer to the, to the, uh, to the life who's the, to the uh, daily lives. And in the third webinar, we uh, talk about productive uses of energy. And there, it was very clear from, from the speakers that it is extremely important to understand the current business, the current businesses of, of the users 
which uh, uh, in order to deliver solution from the types of activities, economic activities, which are not necessarily about energy, but are, I don't know, on agriculture or uh, uh, small shops or it's, or a small uh, uh, industry. So this this kind of, of need to understand what are the opportunities, the, are the conditions of, of people has been uh, across the whole, um, the whole webinars. Therefore, we decided to take uh, to take uh, this topic into 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 a more focus, and I will uh, like now to uh, invite our first speaker, who is uh, uh, Gabe uh, Gabriel Supomowin. He is Gabe. I, I invite you to come in uh, on the uh, on the stage and put your uh, turn your camera on. And, and you can already prepare your presentation. Gabe um, is energy access lead um, in uh, Green Empowerment. Green Empowerment is an organization that is uh, working very closely with uh, local communities for improving their uh, livelihoods, particularly in the, in the field of energy access and, and water. Um, yeah, Gabe. Um, can you turn on your your camera so that we can see? Yeah, you will receive uh, the the uh, moderation uh, so that you can share your slides. Gave um, how how are uh, this um, how, how are you trying to or how are you dealing with this gap between the very local conditions of of communities in Malaysia in Sabah? And this uh, more national-wide or provincial-wide energy planning processes that you are, are leading. Very looking forward for your experiences. Yeah. Hello. Can you hear? Can hello. everybody hear me? Okay. We can hear you very well. Your slides okay. were on, and then very uh, now they are very off again. Uh, ah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Sorry, it's. Uh, First time dealing with this uh, no problem new software. All right, um, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Um, as uh, Willington said, my name is uh, Gabriel uh, Sundoro Win. Um, I am the energy access lead, and for the past two years, uh, I've been spending a lot of time working on this project uh, that we call the Saba RE2 roadmap, the uh, Renewable Energy for Rural Electrification uh, roadmap. And um, this is a multi-stakeholder initiative. So uh, I uh, work within a, a consortium of a couple different uh, organizations. In the capacity of this project, I'm the strategic lead. And uh, we work with uh, local organizations in the Malaysian state of Sabah. Um, so uh, those of you who um, might be unfamiliar with the, the region, uh, Sabah is the northernmost island of Borneo. Uh, it's a it's a you know fairly large uh, landmass about the size of Scotland um, and uh, the reason why I find this to be a, a very interesting uh, project is uh, because you know the way we like to say it is uh, Sabah is a a state that it's um, it's small enough to pivot but large enough to make a difference right. Um, there are a lot of natural resources here, a lot of um, uh, uh, ancient uh, sort of rainforests, um, and there are still, um, in spite of what a lot of others might understand about Malaysia, is uh, still is uh, lacking in in energy access. And this this heat map shows um, the areas within the state that are uh, uh, that are lacking uh, energy access. So. Um, yeah, here's just a few statistics while I just kind of give a little bit more background about where uh, where I'm coming from. So uh, I've worked as most of the past 15 years as a as a developer of uh, of mini grids. Uh, I've built uh, um, mainly small uh, micro hydro powered uh, systems, um, working with local organizations uh, in uh, the Philippines, Indonesia, Malaysia. Uh, and uh, to some extent in, in Myanmar as well. And um, so this was an interesting project to me because we were given the opportunity to sort of bridge this gap between, um, between uh, uh, sort of developers and communities with, 
with uh, uh, the uh, sort of more policy and government perspective. And I think the mandate here was that the government in Malaysia was very interested in seeing how they could reach to 100% uh, energy access by uh, 2035. And so um, what the roadmap is, is essentially a plan to do that. And um, I'll uh, probably go back to this map again a little bit later, but this just shows all of the communities that uh, we've identified, all of the villages within the state that uh, still lack uh, access to energy. So what this project really does is it combines a number of different, it's a very multidisciplinary approach, right? We have a, uh, we have uh, a number of, of local teams. We have a, a, a team in, in, in uh, the state uh, focused on collecting uh, community data. Um, this is uh, in partnership with the local organization that has spent the last 40 years working with uh, communities, helping establish uh, community-led uh, management committees and who we worked with in the past 20 years to build hydro systems and make sure that they are managed and operated well in the long term uh, by the communities themselves. Uh, the other uh, agency um, that we work with uh, here is the state utility and sort of uh, working with the state utility are uh, uh, several teams looking at um, uh, modeling of state energy resources, looking at um, both the state's uh, energy mix in relation to the state's energy potential, um, looking at uh, hydro potential and solar potential within the region and uh, trying to uh, trying to present the least cost option. Oh, I think we missed so, uh, uh, of state planning. Oh. Um, so I think. The other, uh, the other uh, big facet of this, we have a GIS team um, that's been uh, on develop, developing. Hello, am I still coming through clearly? Yeah, we we got a, a kind of um, break, but we can hear you now, Gabe. Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, yeah. So as I was saying. Um, we have a. Uh, we've been uh, working a lot with uh, uh, with a number of mapping tools to uh, try and understand uh, the relationship between um, the villages we're dealing with and uh, the uh, locations of the national grid, which you're seeing here in these um, uh, in these different um, uh, sort of squiggly lines. Uh, so, um, I think just in general, uh, what our core strategies have been in translating the uh, the uh, community needs and the energy access picture um, at the uh, at the community level uh, to the policy level uh, and what our general approach has been um, the first pillar of this has been um, really understanding the local political ecosystem and the leaders of power um, especially with village and district level government um, I've been involved with energy planning in the past, and a lot of the state actors that we are working with are typically at the national level or even at the state level, but not really at this local government level. And I think involving those uh, those uh, district sort of appointees and elected representatives has been a key to success uh, for us, um, particularly in this context. Um, I think. Uh, the other pillar here has been uh, understanding the core incentives for public sector participation, as well as private sector particip uh, participation. A lot of what we do in the energy access space, uh, as a lot of you may know, uh, involves trying to create the right private sector incentives. But I think understanding local public sector uh, incentives for for uh, getting involved and and prioritizing this issue. Uh, has been um, uh, a big, uh, a big uh, uh, sort of success factor for us, and then uh, staying away from controversy. And what I mean by this is, you know, we've worked with groups that represent a number of different interests in in the state, and uh, there are uh, a lot of uh, villages that are considered to be, let's say, um, 
uh, not recognized villages officially by the state. And so in the early stage, just trying to stay away from those types of uh, issues and trying to focus purely on the energy access issues with, this, with, the, with the communities that both us and the government can agree on uh, um, need access to these resources. And, um, and in terms of our approach towards the, the actual process, our focus has really been on obtaining uh, reliable data directly from the beneficiaries uh, that we're dealing with. Uh, so uh, I'll talk a little bit more about, about the tools that we've used to do that. And then um, adapting to those, uh, uh, adapting to existing local approaches and existing policies has been a, a big, a big uh, hallmark of our approach as well. So what I mean by that is um, understanding the the current uh, uh, electrification policies within the state and really trying to uh, understand how we can sort of match our uh, uh, our approach to. Uh, uh, to be able to work within uh, within a system, so realize what is not broken within the current system and what can be what can be uh, translated. And I think finally, uh, there's been um, a bit more of a focus in this project towards uh, anchor clients, not only community businesses but also commercial uh, clients operating in the region. So. Um, this is uh, sort of a example of uh, the types of profiles we're compiling in each of those 200 villages that I uh, had shown. We're, uh, we're basically generating um, individual profiles. We use uh, a Kobo Collect, which is a, a sort of a community survey uh, tool to really understand um, what the local needs are and not only what the local needs, but what the levels of community organization and understanding um, what the what the needs are in terms of, uh, of, of of businesses that might be operating in the region or uh, public buildings that that people prioritize so uh, you know we're looking at all the I, I would say traditional things that we would be looking at in the energy access sector but we're paying a lot of attention to uh, uh, I want to highlight here that we're paying a lot of attention to community organizing and community organizations because we want to know what people who people think would be reliable stewards of of of, uh, of community resources um and these are just a, a couple uh, other examples of different types of villages that we see in this in this landscape um and so after collecting that community data, the approach has been to really understand um, what the local uh, available resources are in these areas. So we're looking at uh, hybrid uh, between solar and we were looking at micro hydro systems uh, and prioritizing that as, a, as, as um, uh, what our models are showing are uh, being the, the, the lowest cost option when uh, it is available. Uh, and using our geospatial tools to help identify where those are. Um, and then looking at solar, uh, uh, where hydro is not possible, and then looking at hybrid systems. So to date, we've done um, uh, about 40 full feasibility studies uh, in the areas that you see listed here. Um, and then we kind of go into like how we would design those, those systems, right? Um, how we would design those energy systems um, and trying to match that to the, uh, the to the the, the community uh, indicators that we identified in that first stage of the process. So what we've found um, through a lot of this uh, uh, through a lot of this 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 sort of community uh, based research has been that um, there are a lot of um, intersecting issues. So it's not we cannot just focus on electrification alone, right? We're also looking at uh, issues like road access and uh, and um, uh, whether uh, and how far uh, places are from uh, from the national grid. And so we've come up with a series of of tools that help the government sort of quickly identify which are the areas, which are the last mile customers, which are the areas, uh, which are the villages that would be least likely to receive any. Um, any uh, uh, electricity resource in the um, uh, in the near future, 
and we seek to prioritize those. So I think um, what we found is that surprisingly, or maybe not surprisingly, um, a lot of what the local government understands as uh, as um, an energy access issue or the difference between um, uh, energy access lacks a bit of nuance, right? Uh, a lot of uh, a lot of our stakeholders have sort of seen that uh, either a village has zero electricity or it has electricity, right? Where in fact, energy access is a much more mixed picture. We find that a lot of villages already have um, uh, some uh, some type of energy uh, system, and uh, so it's really been about working with the government to understand that nuance and trying to pivot um this uh, uh the the current state approach which involves sort of a blanket rural electrification program that doesn't ne necessarily take into immediate count what energy access sources are already available and trying to plan around uh what is already available so for example focusing on upgrading existing systems instead of building new ones or uh focusing on improving um uh improving uh reliability and um, really getting uh, our stakeholders to understand the different indicators we can use to identify that. Um, I think what we've also found and what has surprised our, uh, our stakeholders is, has been um, uh, how, how much willingness to pay uh, there is for energy. A lot of state agencies that we've worked with uh had kind of you know sort of take this default stance that we would be implementing projects and those systems would need to be either cheap or for free but considering that uh people are already spending uh quite a a, a large amount of their daily income just on uh diesel or petrol for generators uh, a lot of this has been well, working with those state actors to uh sort of uh uh, sort of show from the and again show from the from the community uh, data set that we collected that there is actually a very high willingness to to pay for electricity uh, in these in these villages. So um, I guess to summarize uh, what we've tried to do a little bit differently um, is uh, that you know we've really tried to leverage our experience primarily as developers of mini grids. Um, and this has put us in a strong position to understand the uh, local behavior and the local barriers to implementation. So what this, what this, how how this is applied, is that uh, I think those of you who are in the energy access space know how notoriously difficult it is to actually plan for growth uh, at a community mini grid level. And uh, our experience over the 20 years, uh, the, the past 20 years, and looking at uh, demand growth in these very far-flung remote uh, villages and starting to identify the patterns um, has really helped us to uh, to guide the way that we plan so we don't plan for uh, the local or the, the current the current uh, level of demand but we're planning for a level of demand that is much higher right because a lot of these these uh, villages contain residents that do not currently live in those villages because there is no access to energy. So planning for or and trying to understand the relationships between the villagers uh, who currently live in these places, as well as the family members who live outside, and understanding that a lot of those family members with remote working and uh, uh, access to energy and the internet would be able to move back to those villages um, understanding what that would uh, do to impact um, uh, a mini grid and the demand growth in that grid, uh, that's been that's been a big focus of ours. Um, and you know, I think this combination of utilizing the uh, the the currently available mini grid modeling and analysis tools, things like Homer um, and uh, uh, and uh, you know larger state level planning resources like Flexos and using those uh, mini grid modeling tools, but really having high resolution data coming from the communities that the project is built to serve. Um, 
I think another uh, another thing is allowing and empowering local government actors to champion our cause. That's been uh, that's been uh, a big success factor for us is working with these uh, local uh, government uh, individuals and uh, getting them to champion the issue. Um, and then, um, you know, of course, engaging with communities uh, early to ensure um, ownership, participation, and accountability. Uh, and finally, the focus on being cost effective. Um, the current costs of, of uh, that um, uh, the, the Malaysian government uh, are quoting to extend energy access are extremely high. Uh, I think by most country standards, something uh, to the tune of about $25,000 to $30,000 uh, US per household. So, uh, so we are, um, you know, just trying to, I think, I think demonstrating a solution that is a lot more cost effective than that is fairly straightforward and uh, not too difficult. Um, but that's been, that's been, those are, those have basically been our key success factors. Uh, how much time do I have left, Wellington? Uh, that uh, you, you are a little bit uh, over, but uh, I know that you will uh, you don't have too much time to stay with us. Do you yeah, have another, I, so, another slide? No, I have. I had a, so I want. I had some examples of the actual policies that we've tried to implement, but I think uh, we can get to that in the Q and A. And okay. what I'll do is I'll just show you. Um, I'll just I'll just get to the end of the presentation so we can get to the next one. Thanks, Gabe. Yeah, thanks, Ned. I um, it's w amazing what what you are doing. That probably before before jumping to our uh, to inviting our next speaker, who uh, um, happily uh, could join us at the at the, at the last minute. Um, I have one. I have just one question to you, uh, Gabe. You you uh, told us about this idea of prioritizing um or or how to um incentivize public participation the participation of public servants let me say that's a, a very interesting uh, um a very, a very interesting finding from you and what what kind of incentives or what are like motivations that you find interesting <laughs> uh, yeah, for, so... uh, you, you 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 are when you told about public uh, uh um uh, Participation. You you mentioned probably uh, guys that are in the energy secretaries of the of the municipalities or so. Yeah. Don't worry. I'm not. I'm not talking about uh, bribery. Um, uh, <laughs> so, yeah. No. I think uh, it, you know a lot of it is is uh, has been uh, sort of um, looking at it with the lens of um, when we're dealing with higher level sort of public servants. Um, you know, recognizing that energy access is a very big issue for their constituents, right? And understanding where those constituencies are and where energy access is a big priority for the people who are elected representatives and trying to uh -huh. leverage that that uh, that uh, sort of um, uh, uh, a political mandate so to speak and understanding that you know it's really like we're on the same side here right we may not agree on several different issues on maybe uh, uh, on maybe things like uh, 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 it could be like a, a controversial land rights issue or something like this, or the communities that they're working with might not agree there, but we can agree that energy access is an issue. Mm -hmm. I think the second example of this is uh, is it w more with the sort of mid-level um, uh, uh, civil servants has been uh, in like kind of approaching it from the perspective of how can we help you do your jobs better, mm -hmm. right? How can we streamline uh, the um, the way that you might be tendering contracts uh, and identifying uh, good contractors, um, uh, bringing in uh, sort of ideas uh, like results based financing to ensure that we are uh, we are um, uh, that that they can that they can ensure contractor success, and then giving them access to the models and tools that we use and um, uh, uh, to identify the the least cost options or trying to simulate. Um, how a mini grid will perform with different uh, energy resources. So giving them access to those tools and providing trainings and sessions for them to understand how to use those tools. That's that's sort of what I'm talking about in terms of incentives. Okay. No, no, very very interesting. Thank you, Gabe. Um, uh, you you can turn off your your camera for a while. I'm I'm in, I will invite. Uh, 
now <clears throat> Elizabeth Wanja, who is coordinator of the Kenya Climate Change Working Group. Elizabeth, it's nice that you, uh, we are very happy that you managed to uh, to come. Um, I know you are uh, in, in a, a lot of uh, workshops now uh, there in, in Kenya, in Nairobi. Um, we already have your slides, so probably uh, my colleague can start uh, the presentation of, of your of your uh, slides. Elizabeth, can you also present us a kind of overview of how are you dealing with this challenge of, of bringing knowledge for, about the very context and, and of the of the communities in Kenya? And translating them, as as as, as Gabe uh, told us, translating it to um, to these uh, more national wide uh, policies. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, thanks, Willie Tong. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Elizabeth Wanja is my name. I work with the Kenya Climate Change Working Group, uh, which is a national network of those such organizations uh, working on issues of climate change. Uh, energy, gender, and other cross-cutting issues. And we also serve as the East Africa Node for Access Coalition. Thank you for having me today. I will be touching uh, on our work in terms of inter inclusive uh, energy planning. Uh, looking at the energy situation in the country, if you were to do uh, an energy needs uh, assessment, even for the communities, uh, capacity uh, uh, priority needs for the community is energy, will rarely feature. They'll talk of um, the one support on education, the one support on health system, healthcare, the one support on agriculture in terms of the feeds and all that. But energy will come as a as an add-on. So how do we make, make uh, the communities also understand that energy um, is an enabler for them to even thrive in the other sectors, linking this with the next sectors of agriculture in terms of um, crop production, uh, value add and all that. So for today, I'll be presenting the work that we've been able to do um, uh, under support from the UK Pact through a partner based uh, in the UK called Ricardo. That's the outline of my presentation. We will have an introduction. I'll introduce the uh, country energy planning process. Uh, I give an overview of the project, the challenges that we've experienced in implementing the project, and also uh, a conclusion on the same. Next. Uh, yeah. For us as a country, we have uh, our, our constitution, which was um, amalgamated in 2010 and is created 47 counties. Those are the sub uh, national governments. Uh, and uh, a couple of functions were devolved to the county uh, governments, including the energy planning. Despite the energy sector not be, being uh, fully devolved, the, the planning aspect has been devolved to the, to the counties. And uh, in 2019, as a country, we are able to uh, adopt an energy act, uh, which has a couple of provisions uh, and roles that were uh, charged to the national government and also to the county government. Yeah, and this provides an opportunity for the counties now to, uh, in terms of the county energy planning process, the, this provides an opportunity for the countries now to come up uh, with plans which are uh, unique and informed by the priorities and needs of uh, the particular counties that we are talking about. So this is not a one blanket or a one shoe fits all, but this will be county specific for all, each of the 47 count counties. And uh, all of them were supposed to have submitted these plans um, by 2020, but unfortunately due to challenges, including capacity, uh, capacity of the counties, this has not been uh, possible. And that is why we have um, a very robust program by the Ministry of Energy, supported by the European Union, which seeks to support the county governments in the county energy planning process through providing that technical um, expertise. Next slide, please. So I've talked of the capacity issues, which has uh, led to most of these counties not being able to submit their county uh, energy plans as had been envisioned by the Energy Act. And now all these counties were, once they submit these plans, uh, the cabinet secretary in charge of uh, energy was to develop um, an integrated plan for the country, which has also not taken shape due to the delayed submissions of the respective plans. I just reiterate, our updated NDC also identify the energy sector as a priority with a very high potential of 
emission reduction uh, looking at our NDC, which has an, um, an, ambition, an ambition of cutting emissions by 32% by 2030. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, through funding from the UK part, we're able to implement a county dubbed codes, which uh, generally means a county's program for decentralized energy systems. And it looked at supporting uh, three counties, that is uh, Migori, Tanariva, and Baringo. Uh, like I mentioned, we have 47, so the project uh, prioritized the three. And it's sought to uh, build the comprehensive, adaptive, and transformative capacity of the county governments to develop their plans uh, through an energy uh, county energy toolkit. And uh, the toolkit uh, had a focus on the electricity sector, uh, which also takes into account the different technology solutions and the uh, in terms of the mini grid and also off grid. And why we focused on electricity sector, looking at the latest report, we, we see that uh, as a country, we are making progress in terms of electricity access. Uh, even looking at our electricity strategy, electric, electrification strategy, as a country, we envision to have a total energy access by 2022. But this is not the case. We are at uh, over 75%. But again, following COVID, these, roles were, these gains were rolled back. So we are not on track in terms of realizing uh, this particular goal. So, um, uh, as, and still, while well, that, uh, around 3.6 million of uh, Kenyan population live in the rural areas, which are um, under the jurisdiction of the county governments. And this um, limited um, access to electricity has been contributed to, by a couple of um, issues. These include the high connection cost in terms of the high, the upfront cost that you need to, to pay for you to be connected to the grid. Also looking at the uh, inadequate transmission and also the distribution infrastructure and most um, importantly inadequate planning. Next. So for the toolkit, um, before we, we actually started the official implementation, we had uh, to seek that buy-in from the county in terms of political goodwill. We, um, and uh, there was a requirement for commitment letters from the counties that we work with and also from the Ministry of Energy. So that was also submitted in terms of commitment. We also entered into MOUs with the three counties, which clearly stipulate the expectations from each of the entities in terms of the deliverables of the project and also had a very high level sensitization uh, workshop for just an introduction, bringing together or on board um, all the decision makers in the county, be it uh, in terms of the governor, who is the head of the county, uh, the political appointees, the ministers, and uh, all the top uh, cream of the county. We then constituted a um, multi-stakeholder platform, which brings together different stakeholders, uh, including the energy service providers at the national level. We also have the private sector being part of that. We have the National Chamber of Commerce and Industry uh, linking the uh, trade and uh, private sector. We also had uh, a women representative, the youth, and also people living with disabilities sitting in that uh, committee. And for this, it was to provide a platform uh, or a vehicle to drive this uh, process in terms of providing an opportunity for the different players in the space to engage in not only the challenges facing the sector, but also opportunities that they could uh, jointly leverage on and deliver a greater impact. Uh, the toolkit uh, facilitates a, a bottom-up decentralized approach to electricity sector, which then complements the current top-down planning that we have at the national uh, grid infrastructure. And this does uh, enable the counties to be able to meaningfully exploit uh, the ongoing projects that they have and also other roles that they are required to uh, uh, perform as provided for by the Energy Act. And thus, through the project uh, the, or through the capacity and the toolkit, the beneficiary counties were able to gain an understanding of um, the electricity needs of the county, the tools, the guides, the users, and also the processes of collecting data. Uh, like I mentioned, the toolkit is an Excel framework and it comprises a set of databases uh, with a range of resources, including guides and also templates that uh, provide the countries uh, with actionable learning points that uh, suit their unique needs and priorities so that they are able to develop a very robust uh, plan. Next. 
Yeah, the, through the toolkit, of course, in, in, in addition to their skills, it also comes with the software which enables them to, to be able to identify which projects is viable in terms of value for money and also uh, projects that would bring about transformation where the main grid is not uh, passing uh, currently or even not in the next few years. So the toolkit has uh, five uh, modules. And why we adopted a modular approach is that uh, this will provide room for inclusivity in ensuring that um, all the stakeholders are uh, engaged and involved from the onset, and that this uh, up, these modules also feed into each other in terms of informing what the next um, module would provide for. So the first module is around initialization. We have a module on mobilization, planning, implementation, and finally monitoring and reporting. Under the initialization module, uh, this actually is, uh, seeks to reflect the, uh, the county energy situation in terms of what is it known about the county uh, in terms of energy, what are the sources of energy, what are the demands of, on and future projections in terms of energy supplies, uh, what are the challenges and, and opportunities facing the sector. So it's just that's a, 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 a more of an inward reflection in terms of the status and the projections moving forward. Uh, the second uh, module is on uh, mobilization, whereby uh, this is a guide that serves to support the counties in terms of planning and also completing their stakeholder mapping in terms of uh, informing who are the key stakeholders uh, in the county and how and, and how um, they can be involved in energy planning and also what their energy needs will be. The energy needs of a woman living in the marginalized community is not the same energy need that um, a farmer will require. Different uh, communities are not homogeneous, so different categories of people require energy for different functions. Uh, we have the planning module, which uh, provides for tools and also guides um, uh, for the counties to develop an understanding in terms of their electricity needs and also the likely projects that they're able to implement to support some of these needs. The tools uh, also focus on the specific uh, social, geographical context, and also the available resources within the country, the counties in terms of electricity system. And under the planning module, we are able to introduce a software called uh, Homapro, which now enables the counties to exactly uh, tell which projects, be it in terms of grid or off grid, that uh, will make sense at that particular time. Uh, finally, implementation. Um, this is now the blueprint for uh, energy needs in the country, in the county in terms of implementing the projects. And finally, monitoring and evaluation. It's one thing to plan for something, but it can only make sense uh, or bring about the transformation that you are looking forward to if these interventions are monitored. So through the toolkit, again, we are able to provide a very robust M&D framework that uh, ensure that uh, you're able to track a uh, progress of implementation of the intervention. Next slide. So the, the, tool, the modules were developed in a very participatory manner. Like I mentioned, we had uh, consultative forums with different stakeholders, be it the women, uh, the private sector, the young people, and the roles that the different uh, stakeholder uh, categories would play in terms of implementing the energy plan. Yeah, the, uh, the piloting of the toolkit uh, allowed for a deep dive into advanced training, which comprised a combination of structured and methodological planning workshops. Uh, uh, some are also in terms, in form of uh, energy lab sessions, whereby we had uh, sitting with the different counties that we work with in terms of just having a more intimate session to look at the unique or the bottlenecks that, the bottlenecks that they experience in terms of planning. And these are really uh, different and context specific uh, for, for each of the counties. Again, the project also put in place a very, like I mentioned, the M&D plan to ensure that we're able to monitor progress. And for the toolkit, it's not just a toolkit. Uh, on its, uh, on its, uh, it's, it's a means, it's actually a means to, to the energy plan. And it's, it's we will look at the toolkit as a decision making toolkit in terms of informing decisions as far as energy is concerned, not only uh, uh, on, on the energy sector, but also on the next sector. And like I mentioned, uh, following the constitution of the technical committee from the different uh, departments uh, within the counties, 
they were able to appreciate the enabling role that the energy that energy plays and now even looking at the other planning processes that happen in the county including uh, you know for the for kenya we have uh, the five-year planning circles to mainstream uh, called the uh, county integrated development plans and through these plans counties are able to mainstream climate change into the counties and uh, we are now in the in the uh, final in the, in the advanced stages of developing the third round of these plans and uh, borrowing from what we've been able to do uh, with the toolkit development process the counties now have um, an appreciation of why there is need to mainstream uh, issues of energy across all the departments and even looking at the priority areas that they have proposed for the different departments to see that energy is now taking prominence in terms of priority, being to priorities and also being for budgeted for uh, as a critical element. Next slide. Uh, what is or what are we doing differently uh, through this project? Uh, our, uh, the project aims, like I mentioned, to from, from provide for that uh, bottom-up decentralized approach. Uh, which contracts contracts with most uh, of the approaches that we know of, whereby we are looking at um, top down, and so there is not that uh, much of inclusivity. Inclusivity for us, we are able to get even to, even to the bottom uh, to the support level, whereby we are able to gain um, knowledge or an uh, understanding of what the communities really are looking forward to in terms of their energy needs and how this could be planned for even for future in the future years again um, through the multi the constitution the multi stakeholder platform we see that there's room for that um cross sectoral engagement in terms of uh, bringing together the different stakeholders so that they're able to um, discuss and also advance issues affecting the sector be it in terms of opportunities and also um and the challenges and this the beauty of this is that this is not a government-driven uh, process or a CSO-driven process, but through that platform, which brings together now the national energy service providers, the utility company, the county government uh, technical departments, and now these um, development partners working in the counties, and also the CSOs, all these stakeholders are coming together to, to uh, deliberate on uh, issues, issues energy, which is a bit unique about this program. Also uh, on the uh, capacity Elizabeth, building component. So, sorry, Elizabeth, yes. for, for interrupting you, because I know that Gabe probably will not uh, accompany us too too long, and I will. Uh, uh, do you have other? How many slides are still? Like three. Uh, let me just if I uh, I could conclude in, uh, okay. in five minutes maximum. Yeah. So also um, uh, peer to peer learning through the program, you're able to host uh, the counties from the three counties we have region uh, we adopted a regional approach whereby for uh, say for Baringo County we're able to bring on board the 11 counties from the uh, regional economic block for this, for the regional the three regional economic blocks each has uh, five 11 and seven uh, counties um, counties who are now able to be con uh, con convened in a regional learning session whereby the beneficiary counties were able to share with them the lessons learned, the challenges, so that this can also be replicated and uh, taken into consideration as they prepare their respective individual plans. And from this, we identified one of the action points, immediate action points was to develop an integrated um, energy policy for the region, which is a big plus for, for the regional blocks, for the respective regional blocks, which are not in existence currently. In terms of sustainability, like I mentioned, the multi-stakeholder platforms uh, will be there beyond the project. Also, the toolkits uh, will be sh uh, shared with the Council of Governors, which is now providing the secretariat functions to all the 47 counties so that it's easily access accessible and available uh, to support other counties in terms of this process, and also the knowledge that we're able to share through the peer-to-peer -peer learning sessions. As I conclude, uh, Strengthening of the energy planning and delivery at the country level of governance in Kenya through this program uh, will definitely go a long way in terms of empowering communities uh, to, develop, to be able to make uh, informed decisions and also meaningfully participate in the planning and the development of these plans so that they are sustainable and also sound enough in terms of enhancing the households and also the SMEs are able to access affordable and also renewable and sustainable energy. And uh, finally, uh, we're also able to develop um, an investment plan 
which is a very unique uh, plan for as this is only focusing or purely focusing on energy and uh, this county upon penalization the countries will be able to use this as a resource mobilization strategy so uh, as investors will be key uh, whenever they have investors that uh, has always been about to acquire your investment plan but with this plan they'll be able to attract even resources and even have the uh, the county uh, department in terms uh, in charge of planning and budgeting also a portion some percentage of the budget to go into uh, resource into this um, initiative thank you Thank you, Elizabeth. It's a very complex uh, um, program what you are um, leading there. Um, Gabe, are you still there? Yes. Can you, uh, can yeah. you come, yes. come, come uh, a little bit? Because I, I, I it's, it's, both of your, your, your programs has a lot of, 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 of facets and it's very, the idea is not to, 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 um, um, uh to differentiate one of the other or compare but i i i don't know i i found interesting to see how El elizabeth uh, show us this my understanding is that this program is pre one of the central components is this multi stakeholder platform and they are like uh, making a kind of capacity building of all of, of the county uh, officials in, 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 in using these toolkits, but also at, at the end, also creating this, let me say, collaboration or debate as structures. Is there something, uh, in, uh, how do you see that uh, from, from your perspective of your program? Is there also kind of how, how are debates uh, managed in, 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 in Saba? Is there a kind of group coming together to, to debate the results? Yeah, so we've had uh, a couple of, um, you know, we've had a lot of this, this project was basically started during the pandemic. So a lot of the earlier sessions were, were virtual and we had these sort of um, town hall style meetings where uh, we engaged with district government officials as well as uh, community leaders and uh, the government itself. Um, but then we also have had, uh, you know, since, uh, I guess, you know, the pandemic hasn't really ended, so to speak, but since we've been able to travel, uh, we, we have had some, some, some sessions, uh, as well, some sort of public forums. Um, I think, uh, there have been a lot of similarities, I think, from what I, from what I gathered from Elizabeth's program in terms of, uh, the, the multi-stakeholder tools. And uh, I think uh, in our case, uh, we, uh, we have a, a sort of different levels of tools for different uh, actors, right? Um, but what we've been trying to do is uh, create a platform that integrates them, incorporates them together. Uh, so, you know, what, what one user sees, what let's say a community user sees uh, when they're uh, inputting their data would be different than um, you know a planner would see, but there is a a single place where all that information is consolidated, and that's kind of what we're working on now. So uh, so uh, I think you might actually be interested, uh, Elizabeth, in a platform called Odyssey. This is uh, this is the tool that we are uh, using to 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 try and do that. Uh, it's um, it kind of uh, it allows you to sort of authenticate different users. So we're using it as developers, but you could use this tool as an investor, or you could use this tool as a planner, or you could use it as a customer, right? So it's a, it's a kind of, and what you see, the dashboard that you, that you see is different depending on, uh, depending on what, what uh, you know, uh, level of access you're, you're sort of granted. Yeah, that's interesting, Elizabeth. And and from um, because both of your programs, um, data is of course a very uh, and all this data management collection, but also data analysis a kind of, of key of key issue. How um, who is like um, who are the, the the actors that are more uh, in the management of that kind of data in the case of of of, of Kenya, Elizabeth? It's like each county is managing its own its own own um, toolkit, which is Excel-based kit, or how is happening? Yes. Uh, 
for us, uh, each county is managing its uh, toolkit, but um, much of this information is uh, under the custody of, uh, we have a National Bureau of Standards uh, of Statistics, which gives this, and also uh, the utility companies. But actually one of the challenges that we really experienced in the uh, implementation of this project was data accessibilities. There was a lot of mistrust even uh, across the different entities, the energy service pro providers, and also um, the the feeling that uh, there was the, the like the county was trying to uh, to create another entity that would come to do their work. So that accessibility has always remained a challenge, and even getting that um, gender disaggregated data, because you know when you're doing your planning, you need to have uh, gender disaggregated data so that you're able to make an informed planning in terms of um, a plan that will respond, uh, an energy plan plan that will respond to the energy needs of the different. Gender, gender groups that we have in our societies. So yes, for uh, for this specific one, the, uh, the toolkit that we're able to develop is purely a database, and uh, these are uh, hosted by the different countries that we are working with in this program. So we we are actually uh, over over the time that we have planned, uh, but I would like you to to say, I know, a kind of last take away for for the uh, people that are uh, um, hearing us how, how will be like your main recommendations when when uh, an organization is like want to start or or to to design these kind of processes uh, i don't know uh, um, gabe wow um I mean, I think uh, so. That's a big question, but but yeah, like uh, you know, sort of the, as as uh, I sort of hinted at, um, it, you know, it, a lot of what we were able to do was uh, only possible because we'd been working in this region for for such a long time. Uh, it's it's hard for me to make straight up recommendations, um, but I would say uh, I would say that's a big part of it. Working with um, uh, diverse coalitions is obviously uh, is is obviously a recommendation, but at the same time, it presents its own challenges. Right? You have all these different um, these different uh, sort of needs and agendas and egos to manage, and uh, and that comes with its own uh, difficulties as well. But I do think I do think leaning on uh, on organizations that are that are very experienced, and I would say the importance of really hearing from the source. Right? I think. Uh, one other one other thing I didn't mention in the proposal or in the in the sorry in the presentation was uh, the the sort of array uh, of um, of desires we're sort of looking at in terms of community ownership right we sort of uh, in the energy access space or at least the one, the energy access space that I'm involved in they talk you know people talk a lot about community ownership and how that's good and we want that. But you know, a lot of communities don't really care about whether they own energy resources or not. They just want it to work. But some of them do want to own it, right? So it's like, how do you create a framework, a regulatory framework, a regulatory framework that still allows for community ownership while also allowing for non-community ownership if that's what people want? And how do you establish that consensus? So um, having having a process, I think that that makes sure that you're hearing the that. Those voices is, I think, probably my 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 biggest recommendation is 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 um, is not just trusting uh, at face value uh, what uh, might be defined as being a good thing by the energy access community or by uh, the government agencies that you are speaking to or whoever, right? Like really trying to find the truth for yourself. Um, uh, uh, on the ground even though i don't really like saying that but you know uh with the communities so yeah that's interesting it kind of could sound a little bit of paradox yeah. not not fully but uh you know hearing voices but you have a big data uh base so it's not only trusting on data but also on hearing it's quite interesting Thank you, and, and Elizabeth, how, what will be like the main take uh, takeaways for you? For I don't know people in, in other countries that are keen of 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 of, of starting that kind of more bottom up process uh, energy uh, planning processes. Yeah, thank you. I think for me, it's uh, really to think of uh, who are we planning this energy for. 
uh, where the communities in all this discussion are they even aware that um, of the importance of energy in their lives to start with do they consider this as a priority that they need to be part and parcel and uh, to be part of uh, being the decision table as far as energy is concerned also looking at uh, polit political goodwill uh, it's one thing to have the support of the communities and the other stakeholders, but if the political goodwill is not there, you will not uh, make uh, the progress that you're envisioning. And once you have this political goodwill, you are, it's even easy to get a budgetary allocation to support such interventions. And finally, um, leveraging on the existing networks uh, through the program, we're also able to leverage on what the county has already been doing, what other uh, civil society organizations have, have also been doing, and also the networks that had been established in these counties in terms of complementing what uh, we are doing. So you don't need to start uh, a scratch, you don't need to reinvent the wheel, especially where you have a platform that uh, exists, and you just need to see how best you can leverage on that which is already in existence. And finally, for uh, areas where we have uh, uh, political interference, like uh, for us, uh, you know, this program we're implementing at a very um, sensitive time when you're electioneering, the electioneering period, you need to ensure that uh, uh, the people that uh, you work with in terms of the, the decision make makers uh, in the county uh, are well informed of this, but also focus on the technical people who uh, even with the new government, they are still going to be uh, in place so that you don't need to Start now again uh, introducing some of these interventions. Like for us, we worked uh, with, the, uh, with the ministers, of course, and also the technical team, who, even despite the new uh, government in place, they're still there, they're able to uh, carry on the interventions that we started uh, with them a while back. Okay, no, thank you. Yeah, that's, uh, I, I think both of you also highlighted this uh, um, importance of understanding what is already there and uh, Gabe also have some some that kind of ideas and and, and elizabeth uh, is leveraging on existing networks and existing processes of 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 debate probably not necessarily on energy but there are if you are it's a kind of of culture or let me say of of debating concerns um that's also a very very interesting so i'm i'm uh I would like to thank you for for your time. I know this is for you. It was a challenge. <laughs> Sorry for for giving you this this challenge of trying to explain these very complex uh, 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 programs in in just ten minutes. You none of you managed to do it, <laughs> but but it's it's fine. We we uh, I, I think I, I learned a lot, and I and I'm sure my, our our audience has. Learned get a lot of, of inputs on, on, on the complexities, but also the the feasibility of, of doing this kind of, 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 of processes. And, and I, I hope, and I've probably you are with me, we hope that to see more of this kind of, of bottom-up energy exercises in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the energy access space. So thank you to all of you. Please uh, keep connected with us. The, uh, the next webinar will be uh, probably in February and we will touch on um, gender issues in energy access. And yeah, thank you for, for your participation. Yeah, thank you all. Thank you very much. Have a nice day, Elizabeth and Gabe. You as well. Good morning. Bye.